there's been a cultural shift that's been happening, a cultural moment that's been happening surrounding Michael Jackson. It's way past due, and it is testament to the innate ability of human beings to cover for people that they consider talented. There's something in psychology called the halo effect. The halo effect essentially suggests that if you think somebody is good at one thing, it means you think they are good at all things. So you tend to think that beautiful people are smart. You tend to think that people who are smart at one thing are smart at all the things. You tend to think that rich people know what they're doing when it comes to everything. And that's just a normal human tendency. We tend to make snap judgments about people and then we take those judgments too far and we generalize more broadly. Well, Michael, two things are true of Michael Jackson. Immensely talented human being, evil pedophile, right? <laughs> those two things are, are true of Michael Jackson, at least if the allegations are to be believed, which all evidence suggests they should be. And people are having a really tough time connecting those two. They're having a really tough time overcoming the cognitive dissonance of, I like Michael Jackson's music, and I was a big fan of his when I was 10, with Michael Jackson was an evil human being who preyed upon children. Now, both of those things can be true. Well, there are a bunch of lessons to be learned here. Well, some of those lessons include, again, our capacity for cognitive dissonance, blinding us to the reality about human beings. Second, the worship of celebrity that we have in our society. You know, the, the, the rise of a television and movie culture the rise of an entertainment culture that puts celebrities before our faces all the time makes us think that we know celebrities. It used to be that people who were very famous felt distant and far off. Now people who are very famous feel very close to us. And so it's very difficult for us to believe that those people could actually be evil and participating in acts of evil. And that, that sort of stuff is, is something that we all ought to keep in mind, whether we are talking politics or entertainment. When we're, when we're engaging with the public world, it is deeply important for us to recognize that human beings are still human beings, even if they are rich, powerful and famous, and maybe even more so then, because rich, ri because fame and wealth and power, these things allow people to gratify their worst urges and lead other people to, to basically give them the okay to do so, thinking, of course, that the person wouldn't be rich, powerful, and famous unless they were also morally good. And then I bring up the Dahlia Lithwick column is because she suggests this dichotomy, and the dichotomy is basically correct. She says it's oversimplified, but it really is not. It's basically right. She suggests that if Sex with children is truly the product of freely made moral choices. We should deal with it through the criminal justice system. If it is genetically overdetermined impulse and uncontrollable urge, then we can't punish pedophiles. But here is the point. The belief in a free functioning, free society has to be that reasonable human beings have the capacity to overcome their biological instincts, that human beings have the capacity to overcome their tribal affinities, that human beings have the capacity to overcome their urges. If we don't believe that, we cannot have a republic. And here is where psychology shades into politics. We are now living in a, in a world in which we are told that we don't control our own behavior, that our behavior is controlled by impersonal forces far beyond us, that there is institutional racism, sexism, bigotry, homophobia, that controls your life, that it is the broad-based economics of the, of the American system that have determined the future of your, of your life. None of that is true. That your tribal affinity that you, your, your membership in a particular racial clan, that that determines how you will be treated and how the rest of your life is laid out for you. None of that is true, that your choices are not your own. Once you believe your choices are not your own, you end up justifying all sorts of evil behavior. Once you believe that choices cannot be freely made in contravention of biology and tribal affinity, it's very difficult to have a functioning republic. And this is why, in the end, now I, I have an entire book coming out about the subject, the bargain between Jerusalem and Athens, between religion and reason, is deeply necessary. We'll talk about more of this in just a second. So I have a new book coming out. It's called The Right Side of History. It comes out in a couple of weeks. And the central contention that the book makes is that all of human life is based on a certain number of premises that we have to assume. That all of Western civilization is based on certain things that we take for granted. And many of those things that we take for granted are things that we actually get from religious premises. So we all take for granted Greek reason, right? The idea that we can reason our way in and out of problems. Science is, a, is an outgrowth of this belief in human reason and our capacity to reason. But even that capacity for reason is based on even deeper roots. That capacity for reason is based on the idea that you are a free individual capable of exercising a logic that exists outside of you. That you are a free individual, not completely bound down by biology, capable of making choices that you are not just a cluster of meat wandering through the universe, reacting to the environment around you. you know, there's a, a famous philosopher named Baruch Spinoza, and Spinoza, Benedict Spinoza, it, he, he suggested that basically human beings were a stone that had been cast by fate, 
and that we thought that we had willed our own motion, but basically we didn't. We're just along for the ride. All of Western civilization is based on the opposite of that, the idea that you do will your own action, that you have the capacity to will your own action, and in politics, that you are in control of the decisions that you make. And that in your personal life, you're in control of the decisions that you make. That responsibility is the key to a fruitful exchange. That you can't reason with people who don't believe they're responsible for their own actions. That reason itself is undermined by the belief that human beings are not freely capable of making choices. Now, that is, that is the, the conundrum we find ourselves in. We've made excuses for ourselves as a society, blaming all of our activities on outside forces or internal forces. But the freer you think of yourself, the more, the more you think of yourself as a free actor acting in a free country, the more responsible you're going to be, the better you're going to be, because the more responsible you are for your own actions. Right now, we have a society that is dedicated to removing responsibility from people. And then simultaneously, in, in fits and starts, we will try to restore responsibility for certain people. We'll try to go back and, and fill in the gaps and explain why Michael Jackson should be abhorred, even though we've under we've undercut a lot of the rationale for abhorring Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson should be abhorred. He participated in evil activity. He was a free adult, one of the freest people on earth, given his, his, his wealth and his fame. And he chose to do evil things. And his biological urge was not enough to excuse that. And the same thing is true for all of us living in the freest country in the history of the world. Now, I'm not talking that we're all pedophiles, but we all make decisions on a daily basis for which we are responsible. And looking to society or looking to biological urges or looking to anything else to, to blame for our own behavior is a, is a deep problem for a, for a civilization that hopes to continue functioning. If you want a democracy, if you want a republic, you have to believe that you are a free actor capable of acting morally. Both of those elements, you are free, you are capable of making decisions, and you are capable of acting in a moral fashion. Now, again, I am not saying that I'm not even talking about which behavior is moral and which behavior is immoral from a generic secular sense, because I think that we can obviously make distinctions between pedophilia and all other sorts of crime or all other sorts of behavior. With that said, the generalized point, which is that we're going to have to stop pathologizing evil, that it can be true that you have a pathology toward doing something bad, but that you still have the capacity to overcome. That is the essence of Western civilization. And that is being ripped away from us. The, the only reason we're even having this conversation about whether Michael Jackson should have been basically treated as an ill person or as an evil person is because we have lost the capacity to see evil for what it is. Choices freely made by human beings capable of making those choices in contravention of their own biology. It used to be that you'd be able to say, yes, both. Yes, both. He's a sick person with a drive toward doing sick things. And also, he's an adult capable of overcoming that. But once we decide that we're not in control of our own actions, it's very difficult to make the case for Western civilization, for individualism. It's very difficult to make the case for human rights, frankly, because human rights, are, again, are based on this idea that we are each individuals created in the image of God and that we have the capacity to make decisions freely and of our own will. You want to restore a system where people believe in, in right and wrong and where we are responsible for one another and where we don't hurt each other? We're going to have to go back to a system where we assume that your decisions are your own and not the product of some other evolutionary force or some product of some, some other environmental force beyond your control. Now, again, that's not to say there aren't biological forces driving us. There are. That's not to say there aren't environmental forces that put pressures on us. There are. The question is how we shape those environmental forces to get them off our back. But the goal has to be shaping those environmental forces to get them off our back, to maximize human freedom, to maximize the human capacity, because that, that right, the rights, the freedom, they come with duties. You cannot have duties without rights, and you cannot have rights without duties. And we as a society have decided to bifurcate the two. We want the rights without the duties, or we want the duties without the rights. You can't have it, you can't have it both ways. The, right to, the freedom comes with responsibility. Not because we want you to be responsible, but because it simply does. You cannot be a free person if you are incapable of making choices. Freedom comes with your capacity and responsibility to choose. All righty. Meanwhile, on a, a more sort of political note, the illegal immigration surge at the border is continuing. Now the media have finally decided to report on it. Amazing how for two months they said nothing about illegal immigration surging at the border during the government shutdown and while President Trump was pushing Democrats to compromise over immigration. Pretty incredible. But now they're reporting on it, so better late than never, I suppose. The New York Times has a big piece today called Border Patrol Facilities Put Detainees with Medical Conditions at Risk, talking about the underfunding of Border Patrol. They point out 
that Border Patrol simply does not have the resources to deal with this massive influx of migrants. They say an average of 2,200 migrants a day are now crossing the nation's 1,900-mile border with Mexico, many after grueling journeys that leave them injured, sick, or badly dehydrated. Yet most of the nation's customs and border protection facilities along the border lack sufficient accommodations, staffing, or procedures to thoroughly assess health needs or provide more than basic emergency care, a situation that has led to dangerous medical oversights. I don't remember the New York Times reporting this while the entire Democratic Party talked about disbanding ICE and underfunding CBD. I don't remember that at all. But now I guess the media is catching on. Also, the media are reporting that a record number of families are now crossing the border. This is according to the Washington Post. They're reporting that in February alone, U.S. authorities detained more than 70,000 migrants, up from 58,000 in January. Weird. Weird that they didn't report any of this stuff until, you know, after the government shutdown ends and Trump declares a national emergency. How weird. Once again, showing that the media, the media's coverage of these issues tends to have a rather large impact on our public discourse. OK, coming up in just a second, I want to talk about the Democrats and intersectionality and their continued push to avoid the consequences of their own willingness to support anti-Semitism. We'll get into that in, in